Thank you, Pastor. It sure is good to be with you. I always look forward to coming to Fairhaven. I was introduced to Fairhaven back in 1987. That was my first time to come by here and uh, had the privilege to preach. That was in March, I believe, of that year. At that time, my daughter Kathy was getting ready to graduate from high school. And uh, me being able to come here like that, I said, uh, "Hun, I'd like you to look at Fairhaven Baptist College. And so she ended up coming here and graduating. And then my younger daughter, eight years later, came and graduated from here as well. Just praise the Lord. I believe they both got a great education. It was a great place for them to go. And uh, you did a wonderful job on my daughters. Thank the Lord. I've got one serving as a missionary in Puerto Rico. And my youngest, Carrie, she's, uh, her, well, her husband's on staff in our church. Plus, she teaches in our Christian school. So it's, uh, it's been a real blessing. I heard someone say not too long ago, just think, God has been preparing us our entire life for this moment in history. These are momentous days, and I'm not just talking about the pandemic or epidemic or just demic. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like a lot of people. I don't believe all the numbers, but I believe everybody that died, they, they're still dead. You know, that happens when you die, you're just still dead. No matter what you died of, I know in our area, my doctor was telling me about, uh, there were some people he knew got counted as COVID deaths and they died in a car wreck. They tested their blood and they tested positive, so they counted as COVID deaths, but the COVID didn't kill them. And the CDC said not too long ago, only 6% of the deaths were actually COVID-19 deaths. Now that's still, several people that died with that. Uh, now, I came prepared tonight. I've got, uh, I've got my heavy-duty N95, God Bless America mask, and then I've got I Don't Care mask. So I've, I brought them both. I don't shake hands. Boy, what a great excuse that's been for me. Not to shake hands. I, I don't shake hands because I don't want to get sick. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't want that long swab stuck up my nose. And so I'm trying to keep from having that happen to me. Uh, not only that, I mean, dying is not such a bad thing for the believer. You go to heaven. And I've always believed that death for the believer is not just something that's better than the worst of life. It's better than the best of life. It's never bad to go and be with the Lord. Now, other people might be sad, but it kind of reminds me when I, when I resigned from my first church after Bible college, I went into my barber, and I, when I walked in the door, he was an old Southern Baptist preacher, and he said, well, Brother Allison, I understand you're leaving us. And I said, oh, where'd you hear that? And he said, well, some are crying and some are shouting. <laughs> and he was right. Some are crying and some were shouting. But anyway, this is always a blessing to be at Fairhaven, and um, you are sweet people, and you've been very dear to my heart, and of course, we got some students here now, the Jermaine boys. Hope they're not causing you too much trouble. They are? <laughs> Doesn't shock me. All right. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 5, if you would. Genesis chapter 5. Tent meanings are always very interesting, and it looks like you're going to dodge a bullet with this one, by the way. Yep. It's supposed to get real cold on Monday. Yep. And so, um, hey, this, as long as you can dodge the bullet, you're okay. That means somebody's been praying that it hold off just a little bit. Now, if it's, we're freezing cold tomorrow night, <laughs> don't blame it on me. <laughs> Genesis chapter 5, notice first of all, verse 5, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Go down to verse 8. And all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Go to verse 11. And all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. Down to verse 14. And all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Verse 17. And all the days of Mahalaleel were 890 and five years, and he died. And down to verse, oh, let's see, down to verse 20. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. Down to verse 27. 
and all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years, and he died. And then verse 31, and all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years, and he died. Everybody dies. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And God, I pray that you'd fill me with the Spirit of God. I pray you give truths that would not shock us, but Heavenly Father would sober us up in this day. As much as we try to avoid the bad things from happening, as the world looks at them, they still happen. People still die. We're not the exception. And if Jesus doesn't come back soon, we too will come to you by way of death. But Lord, I pray that you'd make these truths so real to our hearts tonight that we decide to live on purpose and make our lives count for you. And Lord, we'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I figured it out. I believe I multiplied the right numbers. But whether there was a pandemic or not going on, 172,000 people die every day. Now think about that. 172,000 people die every day, even without a worldwide sickness, every day. We hear about great tragedies where a few hundred die in a plane crash. And it is a tragedy. But the reality is 172,000 people die every day around the world. Most of them die without having ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Most of them close their eyes in death and wake up in hell. I don't know how long I'm going to have to live. I didn't expect to live this long. My father died at 63. My mother died of 58 cancer. My dad died of a massive heart attack. So I didn't expect to live as long as what I've lived. I'm 71. Thank the Lord. I guess maybe good living. I mean, my mom and dad were both drinkers and smokers, and I've never done either one. Didn't get saved until I was 22. And maybe that's allowed me to, well, no, Bible says that he's appointed unto man once to die. Job tells us that you can't go by that appointment. So maybe it has nothing to do with the fact that I didn't smoke and my mom and dad did. Maybe it has to do simply with God's appointed time. As I look about us today, you can't see it and I can't see it, but the truth is there's an alarm clock above your head and it's getting closer and closer to going off. Now for some of you, it'll be years before it'll go off or others, it might not even be a month before it goes off, who knows? We don't know, but the Bible does give us truths to deal with that. In 2016, I read a story about an Indonesian man by the name of Umbath, I'm sorry, Umbagatho from Sragan in central Java. He was born on December 31st, 1870, according to the date of birth on his identity card. At that time, in 19, or in 2016, he was 146 years old. They said in the clipping about him that he was the longest living human recorded in history. They had obviously never read Genesis chapter 5. He wouldn't even make teenager. But now still, 145 years is a long time to live on planet Earth. And they asked him about it, and his answer was, I just want to die. Isn't that amazing? Living that long, and he just wanted to die, which he did a year later in April of 2017. Now, in the article, Umbagatho had outlived all 10 of his siblings four wives, and all of his children. His nearest living relatives were grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. One of his grandchildren said his grandfather had been preparing for death ever since he was 122. <laughs> so he had spent the last 25 years of his life 
preparing to die. How sad. Yes. Even brought a burial plot. In 1992, not knowing that he had 24 more years to live, they had asked him one time what was the secret of him living so long, and he said, patience. I thought, that's interesting. There was another man, wasn't quite that old. They asked him the question, how in the world did he live so long? And he said, well, I guess it's because I just hadn't died yet. <laughs> Well, now, after reading the article, I decided I wanted to check on who were the longest living people in the different countries around the world. And the thing I noticed about all of them, some of them lived a long time. Oh, as far as my small 71 years is con concerned, they all lived a long time, but they had one thing in common. They still all died. <laughs> Death is real. You say, whose fault is that? Why does God do that? Don't blame that on God. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. And the Bible says that for by one man, sin came into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Now death is not a pleasant topic, but it is something that every one of us has to deal with. I'm 71 now. I don't know how long I'm going to live, but I know I'm getting closer to death day. Now, personally, I'd like Jesus to come back and just catch us away. And that is the blessed hope that we're all looking forward to. But either way, I get to see Jesus, and that's wonderful. Death, as someone said, it's not that life is so short, but that being dead is so long. And think about it for just a moment. Now, I'm glad that we don't have to be ignorant about death. Amen. And he's written a number of things in Scripture, so we don't have to be ignorant about death. And let me give you four truths tonight. First of all, there is the certainty of death. Again, Hebrews 9, 27, as it is appointed unto man once to die after this judgment, it is appointed. You understand young and old die. You don't have to be old to die. Now, mba. He may have been very old by our standards, but there have been a lot of people. I've done funerals for babies. I've done funerals for young teenagers. I've done funerals for those that were in their 20s and in their 30s. I know when I went to my first church after Bible college, the first funeral that I did was of a young father, 33 years of age, strong fella, six foot five, worked as a telephone repairman. He was up on one of those telephone poles and he unfortunately got too close to the electric wire and it jolted him out of the bucket, hit his head on the truck when he came down and killed him. Father of three, sharp young man. Matter of fact, he was a deacon in our church. He was a good guy. I'm just simply saying to you, young and old, die. My cousin Ed, he was one of my best friends growing up, even though we lived 120 miles apart. Uh, he was part of the rich side of the family. I was the poor side of the family. And we, we'd go to Chicago uh, once a year just to spend some time with them. And sometimes he'd come over to our area because his dad had purchased a farm in our area. And we were just always very, very close. He had moved down to Birmingham, Alabama. That's several years ago now. He was 31 years of age. He had been married for just a few years, and he and his wife were expecting their first child. He was out bowling in a bowling league, and um, he had thrown the ball in the 10th frame of the first game. He turned around, he walked back, sat down in the chair, put his head back, and was dead. Massive heart attack like that, 31 years of age. No reason to think he was ill or anything like that. Good friend of mine, a preacher down in Arkansas, a few years ago, his 15-year-old son was playing basketball with their Christian school. He was going down the right side of the court and suddenly just collapsed and was gone in no time. Young and old people die. It's a certainty. Everybody dies. Rich and poor people die. A lot of times we just think of those, those poor people that die, but rich people die as well. As a matter of fact, Jesus told us a story about that. The beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried in hell. He lifted up his eyes being in torment. Rich or poor, I don't care how much money you make, it's not going to keep you 
from dying. You're still going to die. They used to say back when Howard Hughes died, he said, you know how much of his money he left behind? And the answer was all of it. All of it. I always thought this just seemed right to me, Pastor. But uh, you read about some of these fellas, they made millions of dollars, but they died broke. And I thought, now there's somebody that did it right. They spent it all. I mean, what's the point of making all that money and then just have it sit there in the bank? So that the government can get the death tax on it, I guess. That's what it's about. Although I have learned this in my years. And finally, now that I am up there and being old, that I understand now why they told me to save money when I was young. So I could pay the doctors now that I'm old. <laughs> That's the way it works. But healthy and unhealthy people die. Yule Gibbons, boy, he promoted health and eating right. Oh, don't you get sick of all this eating right stuff? Eating right, eating right. If you eat right, nothing tastes good. It's like having COVID-19 all the time. You can't taste anything. He died. There was a man who wrote a book, Running Your Way to a Long Life. He died at 52 running. By the way, have you ever seen a jogger smile? Ever? Ever? Why would I want to do that? Good friend of mine who's in glory now, Brother Robert Rooker, good preacher down in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. He was up in his 70s, and uh, he had gone to visit a lady who had had congestive heart failure a couple of times, but they kept bringing her back. She was in the hospital. She had been so close to death, and he went to visit her, and he left that visit to go to a hospital in another city to s visit somebody else. On his way there, he had a massive heart attack, hit a bridge abutment, was dead, probably was dead before he hit the bridge abutment. And I was thinking, isn't that interesting that that lady was so near death, everyone expected her to go, and now we're doing the funeral for Brother Rooker. I'm just simply saying healthy and unhealthy people die. People who live dangerous lives die. That's why I'm not jumping out of an airplane. I don't care how good the parachute is, and I'm not going to tie some rubber band to my ankles and jump <laughs> off a bridge. I don't understand that one bit. By the way, I'm not going to do that anymore, and I'm going to pick up a rattlesnake in the service. It may be exciting, but I don't need that excitement. Amen. I'm just not going to tempt the Lord. That's all there is to it. He can take me out too easy. I, I like to golf once in a while, and when I hear thunder, I go to the house. Because I may not be able to hit the golf ball, but I think God could hit me. I'm not tempting him. But dangerous and safe men die. You think of King David. David lived 70 years, and David was a warrior. Man, he was in battles. People were trying to kill him, and yet he lived to 70 years of age. In Luke chapter 12, you've got a farmer that Jesus talked about that had built these barns, and now he was ready to eat, drink, and be merry. And Jesus said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be desired of thee. He was going to die that night. Yeah, we've got great plans, but death doesn't wait for our plans to be fulfilled. We have no guarantee of living any longer. As a matter of fact, down in Alabama a few years ago, you know, we have, Al we have tornadoes in Alabama. And I know you have tornadoes here sometimes, but you guys know nothing about tornadoes. We have tornadoes in Alabama. As a matter of fact, in, in let's say 2011, we had 128 tornadoes just in the state of Alabama. I think that same date, April the 27th, I think there were over 230 tornadoes in the south Two of them hit my house the same day. First one went through and it kind of skirted by my house, took down nine of my trees, put one of them on the roof of my house. My wife was at home. I was not. I was at church. I wanted to be in a safe place. And, uh, but I was there early. She wasn't skipping service or anything. But the second tornado came through, picked the tree up off the house and laid it in my backyard for me. I thought that was nice. I was... I was getting ready for the Wednesday night service at church and I heard the wind blowing in the back of the building and heard the, the uh, ceiling begin to come off. The roof was coming off. And so I dove into my office and kind of hugged around the, the closet that was there. I figured that was the strongest part of the building. And it went through, took the steeple off the building and everything. But there was a lady in Alabama a few years before that 
tornado was coming through. And down in Alabama, you understand, most people don't have basements. And what they do have, if you drive through the South, you'll see a lot of outdoor storm shelters where people will have to walk outside during the storm, go into the storm shelter so they can at least survive. She did that. She went out to her storm shelter. Well, the tornado missed her house, but picked up a tree and threw the tree through the door of the storm shelter and killed her. As it is appointed unto man once to die. After this judgment, you understand there is the certainty of death. But then there's also the uncertainty of death. And you say, what's that, preacher? You don't know when you're going to die. And you say, well, I could take care of that myself today. No, you don't understand. There are a lot of people who tried to do that only to survive. I mean, I've known people that were bad shots. And they blew their jaw off. But they didn't kill themselves. Truth is, you don't know when you're going to die. And the Bible warns us of that. In Proverbs 23 and verse, or 27 and verse 1, he says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. I've got plans for tomorrow, but I realize those plans may be interrupted by death. I have no guarantee of tomorrow. He tells us in James 4, 14, What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. He even warns us in Proverbs 29, 1, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. I understand something of that. I'd witnessed to my dad several times about getting saved. I thought he was close one time, but he still wouldn't make a decision. My dad, a hard living fellow, I love my dad, but he didn't want anything to do with God. And so one night after a night of drinking, about two o'clock in the morning, he just had a massive heart attack and went out into eternity. Never woke up. He had plans for the next day too, but you know death doesn't wait for our plans to be fulfilled. It doesn't happen. Some of you remember December the 27th, 2004, there were a lot of Americans that were in the uh, Southeast Asia at, on holidays. Matter of fact, we had several around Huntsville that were on the beaches during that time. And there was a big earthquake in the Indian Ocean that sent a tsunami all across that part of the world that killed hundreds of thousands of people. None of them were expecting that to be a bad day to, be, to begin with. As a matter of fact, there were even people on the beach. And they were shocked when all the water went out. And then they stood there, frozen, trying to figure out what was going on. And by the time the water came in, it was too late to do anything about it. They couldn't escape it. Hundreds of thousands went out into eternity. Have no idea when. How many die playing sports? How many people get on the highways thinking, you know, they're going someplace on purpose? Only to get killed. Sometimes we have as many as 55,000 people killed on the nation's highways every year. 26,000 26, alcohols involved in. We have no guarantee. And of course, now we don't have enough people that are doped out on the road. We decided to legalize marijuana and a bunch of other drugs. It used to be one out of every 10 people really weren't in control themselves, just thanks to alcohol. Now we got these other drugs. Don't you feel safe about getting in a car right now? It's a dangerous thing to do. You got no guarantee of getting there. There was a man by the name of Harold Lee Duncan. He was out mowing his wife and children were watching him mow the yard. Suddenly, he grabbed his chest. He fell over dead. When they did the autopsy, they found that the mower evidently had picked up a little quarter-inch piece of wire and threw it right through his heart and killed him. Now, the strangest that I've ever read about was a man by the name of Carlos Umbas. He lived in the Philippines. He was fishing. True story. Now, I'm not making this. I'm not preaching. This is a true story. He was fishing, and he was getting tired, and he took a big yawn, and a fish jumped out, got lodged in his throat, and he choked to death. That's why I don't go fishing. <laughs> what a horrible way to go. Some of you older folks remember the name Mama Cass Elliot. 
She was one of the main singers with the Mamas and the Papas back in the 1960s. And after they broke up, she went out. She did concerts on her own around the world. She was in England. She just got done doing a concert, went back to her hotel room, ordered a sandwich. She lay in bed watching TV, eating the sandwich. She choked on the sandwich and died in her own vomit. She had absolutely no intention of any of that taking place. I'm just simply saying the uncertainty of death is you don't know when. I happened to be in Washington, D.C. on 9-11-2001. And I remember we were on a bus. There were a bunch of pastors. We were on a bus. We were going to the White House. And we were just, had just arrived and somebody said a plane has hit one of the towers. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. We had no clue as to what was going on. We walked around. We're getting ready to come in to meet with some of the administration about education matters. And uh, suddenly people at the White House came running out. They said, run, there's a plane headed for the White House. Later, of course, we found out. And by the way, one hit the Pentagon as we were walking back to our hotel because all traffic was stopped. We just, uh, you know, everybody's wondering what is going on. We could see the smoke rising from the Pentagon on our way back to the hotel. But over 3,000 Americans went out into eternity that day, and all of them were just expecting that they were going to go about their regular day. I'm simply saying the uncertainty of death is you don't know when it's going to happen. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow. It might not be for 60 years, but you don't know. Job said in Job 14, 5, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. There's the certainty of death. There's the uncertainty of death. You don't know when. But there is also the certainty of judgment. And you need to get a hold of this. Again, Hebrews 9.27. As it is appointed unto man once to die, after this, judgment. I remember the first time I tried to witness to my dad. I said, Dad, where would you go if you were to die today? And he said, to the grave. I said, no, Dad, your body would go to the grave, but where would you go? Uh, you can sit back there all you want and try to philosophize and try to talk yourself out of heaven and hell, but it doesn't change the reality of it. You say, well, I just don't choose to believe that. Well, that's not going to change where you're going. You have to understand eternity is coming and there will be judgment. God says it. You say, how do you know that for sure? Well, in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, Paul is preaching on Mars Hill, and he says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because God hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, by the way, that's Jesus, and hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. The proof that there is a coming judgment is that the tomb is empty. He rose from the dead after dying for our sins. A testimony to all the world that judgment is coming. Now you can count on it. If you've never been born again, your judgment's going to be at the great white throne judgment. If you're one of those who is saved, your judgment's going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. But I want you to understand that the judgments do not determine where you're going. If you're at the great white throne judgment, you are going to the lake of fire. If you're at the judgment seat of Christ, you're on your way to heaven. There's a difference in the two judgments. Now, the first judgment that I mentioned, the great white throne judgment, is mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. Beginning at verse 11 on through verse 15, he describes it, but he ends it this way in verses 14 and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You die lost. And it is an eternal lake of fire, a torment that never ends. Jesus describes it this way in Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night. Jesus 
mentioned in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, then shall he say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, one of the reasons why this church has been so busy all these years trying to reach people with the gospel of Christ in their meetings, with their buses, in their weekly soul winning, and the different ministries that they have is because that when people die without Jesus, it means an eternity in hell with no hope of escape. And they don't want that to happen. Besides that, even though it may irritate people in the community to see those Fairhaven people knocking on their doors again. They don't get it because they're not saved, but when they get saved, they'll say, thank you. Yes. Thank you for caring. I was brought up in Sturgis, Michigan. That's only about, what, 90 miles from here, maybe even a little bit closer than that. And it was, of course, our family was not a Christian family. The only people that ever knocked on our door were the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. Now, there's a couple Bible-believing churches in Sturgis at that time and uh, that knew the gospel, but they never knocked on our door. My mom and dad were both drunkards. I mean, they knew all the cuss words and they used them on one another. I remember as a little boy laying in bed at night hearing my mom and dad cuss one another after a night of drinking and just lay there and just cry. I didn't know any better. And so I, brought up, I was brought up with the same foul mouth. I'd heard it all the time. But nobody ever cared to ever come by. And had I been riding with my dad one day and gotten into an accident and been killed, I doubt that anybody in Sturgis would have been crying over that Allison family that went out into eternity. They didn't care. You care. You care. You go run and tell people about Jesus. You know, I can't do anything about my dad. My dad died a number of years ago, and he died without Christ. I tried to win him after I got saved. I talked to him about Jesus. I did not want him to go ahead to hell, but, and, and God wanted to save him. God put his son on the cross of Calvary to die for my dad's sins, just like he died for my sins. God wanted to save him even more than I wanted him saved, and I wanted him saved. The only thing I can do now is something for other people's dads and granddads and moms by taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to them because I don't want them to go to hell. You understand there is the certainty of judgment. Now for the lost, that means standing before God at the great white throne judgment, being cast into the lake of fire. For the saved, it means standing before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the things that we've done in this body. And he describes that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, when he says, every man's work should be made manifest for the day shall declare it. And it shall be revealed by fire as to what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive reward. If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, though he himself shall be saved. Yet so is by fire. Thank God for the saved. You're going to heaven no matter what. But you are going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for how you've lived your Christian life. Whether, whether or not you've made account in the winning of souls for whom Jesus Christ died. You'll give an account. What would it be like for you? Wouldn't it be ashamed to enter into heaven and not have anybody that you brought along with you? You still get heaven. I've heard people say, well, that's the most important thing that I get to heaven. And I agree with you. That is the most important thing that you get to heaven. But that doesn't mean the rest is not important. Dr. Bob Kelly, who preached here, I know a number of times, he was a dear, dear friend of mine, a preacher's preacher. I, I, matter of fact, I dreamed about him about three years ago. He died a few years before that. And uh, when I woke up in the morning, I thought it sure was good to see Brother Bob again. Amazing how real that dream was. But uh, he talked about when he was in Bible college, he had gone out to a meeting with J.R. Faulkner. When they were coming back, they came over Missionary Ridge down there in Chattanooga, and they saw a fire and, uh, down in the valley. And so they decided, instead of going back to the school, that they would, go, they would go down and see what was going on. And so they went down there. The fire trucks were there, and they were putting the blaze out. It was still burning. And there was a woman who was screaming. 
She was screaming because two of her kids were still in the house. She was trying to get in. They were holding her back. There was just no hope. The whole house had been engulfed with the flames. And that laid such an effect on Dr. Kelly. He said, you know, she could have sat there like a lot of Christians think they're going to do at the judgment seat of Christ and say, well, <laughs> at least thank God I made it to heaven. She could have said, well, at least thank God I got out of the house alive. But she was weeping. She was crying. She was broken because she got out alone. You know, we sing the songs about no tears in heaven. That's not totally true. It is not until after the great white throne judgment that the Bible says, and he shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. When we see the people we could have witnessed to and didn't, that we didn't take the opportunity and the time to tell those neighbors Tell those loved ones at work. Tell those family members. We didn't do all that we could to try to reach them with the gospel of Christ. And we see them cast into the lake of fire. I believe we'll be shedding tears for a wasted life. And dear friend, we're without excuse. We know better. We know the command of Christ to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I've never read any place where he has taken that away. It's still our command. It's still our responsibility, the certainty of judgment. And that will lead me to the last thing, and that's the certainty of eternity. Now, for those who may doubt, in John 14, 2, the night before Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. And then he said this, if it were not so, I would have told you. You know, a lot of people think that Jesus talked about heaven to make people feel good. No, Jesus said no. He said, if there weren't mansions in heaven, I wouldn't have told you there were mansions in heaven. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. He's the one who talked more about hell than anybody else in the scripture. He talked more graphically about hell than anybody else in the scripture. Why? Because it's true and he doesn't want you to go there. You say, well, how can I escape hell? Come to Christ. You know, you can be ready for eternity by simply faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible puts it this way in 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. You see, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants you to go to heaven when you die. And friend, if you don't have it settled, you ought to come to Jesus Christ tonight. And the invitation tonight, you ought to just come. There'll be people at the front who'd be glad to take a Bible and show you how you can have Jesus Christ as your Savior tonight. What a glorious night this could be in your life. In the midst of all that's going on in our nation, so much turmoil, you can have peace in Jesus Christ. The way, the truth, and the life. And Christian, if you're not living for God as you should... Don't you think it's time that Jesus gets your best in living for him?